Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start. We'll continue on in tutorial 11. Now, uh, this is adding an event listener. Um, probably the examples will mean more than anything, but the, the idea on it is you have something sitting there listening for an event to happen. Um, if I told you to listen for somebody's coming in the front door, well, you'd do other things, wouldn't you? But you'd sit there and listen to see if anybody's coming in the front door. Same type of principle. Our format is listener and then our event, comma, and then the function we want to we wanna run. Uh, object is object which the event occur, occurs, event is the event, and function is a function that is run in response to the event. Now here, um, we're going to add an event listener for the mouse up event. Document dot, and then uh, add event listener, then mouse up, and then we um, will run this in background function. Now notice where this is at. This is uh, contained within your, um, your other code. I never have actually used this one, so let's uh, let's do it just to see what it looks like. So document dot add event listener. Mouse up. And then I'm going to call uh, add it. Um, Not sure if I need the parentheses there or not, since I've never used that. How about put the parentheses there? Because typically we do, whenever we call a function, you have to put parentheses on her. Forty-five. I don't see it running. Hmm. Maybe I'm putting it in the wrong place. Like I say, I've never, I've never used that. Whenever I program any of these, I don't put listeners on there. Not, not in this package anyway. Where I put it at is I put it uh, right here. This is kind of its own built-in listener. You see this in some packages. Um, if you do app development uh, in the Android world, the, you can add listeners. Um, typically, we let the package do it. Uh, so we control it by putting it behind a mouse, mouse click or something. Uh, to remove it, you do your remove listener method. And uh, you do your object.remove listener event uh, function. Um, so again, whatever you're trying to program, and then the, uh, the function you want to call, the code. I wonder if it's because I put parentheses. Let's try that. Uh, not there. Up here. Ah, did work. Um, what do you think this implies that it um, it's going to happen? Yeah. 
Well, it's our mouse, right? Up. What do you think that probably goes with? Releasing a button? Yeah, releasing a button. So I'm over here, and if I click on my mouse, it's I'm holding it down now. If I lit up, see how it runs that code? Now, I don't know where you'd actually ever use that in real life. You know, like you care that somebody's lit up on their mouse button. Um, that would be more of a programming type thing. Like if you're trying to drop something on your form, when you let up on the mouse, that's where you drop your component. So you could use it in a lot of other places, but I don't, I'm not sure if I see the power of JavaScript for that. Although a couple of you are going to indicate going to game programming. Uh, they do program games in JavaScript. Um, so you can do that. Now on mouse down. I wonder if this will probably really screw it up. If I could ever spell. If there's a mouse up, I'm guessing there's a mouse down, right? Problem with this is if I click and hold my mouse down, when the alert box pops up, I think it'll probably take away my mouse control. So I might actually go ahead and do it twice. Okay, so let me refresh this. I click and hold my mouse down, there it pops up. I have to come up here to click it. Only did it one time, didn't it? So this mouse, um, mouse down, the fact that I had to interact with the screen uh, negated the uh, mouse up event. Now you're, you may wonder. Well, you said that you only use it down here. This is when you're not pro, you're not attaching to a specific element on your web page. You know, here I might be attaching it to a button. I might be uh, attaching it to a text box up here. Now some of these you don't have to um, just put them on buttons. On some of these, you can program it like an input. You can put it here. I don't know if um, on click will do anything here. Let's see. On click equals alert. Hi. Let's see if that does anything. Of course, by clicking, I'm going to push my mouse button down, won't I? Uh, refresh that. I'll click here. Question becomes, which one was which? Let me temporarily get rid of these. Okay. See, and I just clicked in there, and it's popped up with hi. No, does it make sense to program you clicking in here? I don't know. It's whatever you're trying to do. You ever have when th uh, things pop up when you start clicking around? Do you like that? I hate it myself. It's just like, let me enter all my data in, and then I, let me press my OK button or, or order or whatever it is, and then, then tell me what's wrong. Because it takes me a while to get everything quite correct in the, when I'm ordering something. Now, I would encourage you as I go through this to go ahead and uh, try these examples um, on your own computer. You know, bring up Notepad, you know, you create a web page, and, and put these in there. Controlling event propagation, um, browser has its own default responses to events. Just like um, we, we looked at the conflict, you know, with that mouse up and mouse down. You know, one of them negated the other one, you know, and so it has its uh, how it's going to respond. It says apply the following prevent, uh, prevent default method to the event object to prevent the occurrence of the browser's default actions. Um, what would be a default action of a browser that you can think of? Refresh. 
Refresh might be. Maybe you'd want to change that. That'd be an example. Close in browser. That has a certain certain thing that's done, right? So those are examples of um, ones that default actions. Alternatively, you can prevent the browser's default action by returning the value false from the event handler uh, function. That was up here. Remember, the capture equals false, capture is equal true, so forth. The return uh, false statement does not prevent default actions if the event listeners are used in place of event handlers. Um, here's an example. Uh, you see they put e dot prevent default. So prevent the default action of selecting uh, table text. Selecting table text. What would be the default action of selecting a table? I don't know myself. But... One thing would be what? It gets highlighted, doesn't it? So if you select something, it highlights it. Maybe uh, by doing an E prevent default, then it wouldn't highlight it anymore. JavaScript supports the key down, key press, and key up events. Allow users to interact with the web page and browser through the keyboard. So you got key down, key is pressed, uh, key press, uh, key is pressed down and released, result in the character being typed. And key up, a key is released. Now, the key down and key press events are similar in name. The difference between them is as follows. Uh, key down and key up events are fired in response to the physical act of pressing a key on the keyboard. Uh, so you press it down. And of a key moving up when it's no longer being held down. So you're releasing it. So the up and down of the, the key. Key press event is fired in response to the computer generating a uh, character. Here's some more um, keyboard events. We got our um, event dot alt key returns a Boolean value indicating whether the alt key was used in the event. Control key is a control. Uh, character code returns the Unicode character code of the key using the key press event. Key returns the text of the key using the event. Not supported by the Safari browser. Hmm. Key code returns the Unicode um, Unicode character code of the key using the key press event or the key code using the key down or key up events. I'm just sitting there wondering why it's not supported in the Safari browser. Um, could be that the machine architecture is a little bit different on a Mac. And um, I don't know. I program so much on Windows that I can't say if all the ASCII uh, character sets are, are the same on a Mac. I don't even know how Mac's designed, to be honest. Okay, location. Returns the location number of the key where zero is a key located in the standard position, one is a key on the keyboard's left edge, uh, two is a key on the keyboard's right edge, and three is a key on a numeric keypad. Some of you use Blender. Does it use the location? Of the key. Uh, it does. Yeah, if you press a 0, 1, 2, 3, all those on the, the numeric keypad over on the right-hand side, um, it'll be different than if you press a 1 or 2 across the top. I sometimes forget that. The what? Yeah, and that's why I was making the connection between this and... Uh, um, Blender because it, it shows what in the world are they talking about there. 
know, one's a one. Well, no, not necessarily. Like if I got a cube here, if I press one here, doesn't do anything. But if I press a one on my numeric keypad, then it does this. Now, still what's coming across uh, from the keyboard is a one, but the location is also. So in some applications, you may want to program, uh, program that. Now, some of these, I don't understand where they're, where they're coming from, to be honest. Zero is a key located in the standard position. I pretty well understand that. Uh, one is equals a key on the keyboard's <laughs> left edge. Is there ever a numeric, or is there anything ever on the left edge? I don't think so, but maybe, maybe there is. Key on the keyboard's right edge? I have no clue what that's referring to. I know what numeric keypad is. You know, that's your keypad over here. Yeah, I don't know about those locations. Okay, meta key. Returns a Boolean value indicating whether the meta key, the command key on Mac keyboards, or the Windows key on uh, PC keyboards was used in an event. I think I had a student teach me something this semester. It was probably one of the best things I've learned in 10 years' time. Um, does everybody know how to how to arrange your windows on the screen? So it appear really, you can see both windows. What do I have to do? That's what I've done in the past. A lot easier though. I got uh, PowerPoint up here, don't I? If I hold down my Windows key and I do my left arrow key, it puts it exactly over on the left-hand side. Now, if I have a Blender here, if I do my Windows key and the right arrow key, it does it perfectly like that. I'd always, um, uh, you know, get rid of the uh, full screen and I'd resize, move, and so forth. And this was just fantastic because then I could show both on the screen at one time. That is checking to see if you press the, the Windows key. So again, that's an example of where you would um, want to know that. Um, nobody in here is in the uh, iOS app development, but um, sometimes when you hold down the, con the control key and do various functions in Xcode, it, it performs um, differently. If you don't hold down the control key, moving a button is just like moving it. When you hold down your control key, it like makes a connection between your button and the code. Now, again, don't ask me where you'd actually use these in a web page, you know, but I can see where they're used in normal programming. And shift key returns a Boolean value indicating whether the shift key was used in the event. Um, I have no clue on what that shift key is used for. You might think, well, that's used to tell it whether it's a lowercase or uppercase letter. Remember the ASCII uh, chart, though? Lowercase a is different than an uppercase a, isn't it? I'm assuming the keyboard is sending the ASCII, you know, equivalent of what you pushed. But I don't know, maybe not. Um, which returns the Unicode character code of the key using the key press um, or the key code using the key down or key up. The value associated with the key event property is affected by the event itself. For the key press event, the character code, key code, and which properties all return a Unicode character number. Uh, sample values of the character code, key code, which, and key properties for different keyboard keys and events are shown in uh, the figure 11-29. A.
I'm wondering if this has any connection between ASCII. I think it does. But... Hmm. Yeah, little a is 97. In Z, there it is, 122. So that those correspond directly to our ASCII table. Modifier keys, Alt, Control, Shift, and Command keys. In addition to character keys, uh, JavaScript uh, supports modifier keys through the use of the Alt key, Control key, Shift key, and Meta key properties. Um... The example really doesn't prevent, present a good one that we can use. Let's see if there's another one. Let's see. I'll put it in the, here with the, so we're passing in an E. If E dot shift key Then I'm going to say alert, shift key pushed. I had to put it into a listener if I had to guess. Because it doesn't know what E is since I'm not passing anything in. Um, JavaScript shift key. Let's go Google that and see if we can find an example. Find out whether or not a shift key was pressed when a mouse button was clicked. So, um, body on mouse down is key pressed and then passing in an event. Key press event. Click somewhere in this document. Learn box to tell you the shift key was pressed when the occurred. So if I press here, shift key was not pressed. 
I hold down my shift key and it says the shift key was pressed. So it's knowing whether I uh, pushed it or not. Now let me put press it and not hold down and you'll see it pops up. Should. Was not pressed. So it's talking about is it being held down is what that shift key does. You ever see that in a, a web page where you had to hold down a shift key for it to do a specific event? No, I've never seen it. <laughs> I'm not sure why you'd use it, really. It'd take a lot of training freedom to understand what in the world they were saying, right? We usually keep web pages a lot simpler than that. That's why you don't use this stuff. I mean, it's out there, but um, you don't typically use it that much. <laughs> Cursors can be defined uh, using the following uh, CSS cursor style. So you got cursor, colon, cursor types, where cursor types is a common separated list of cursor, cursor types. JavaScript command to define cursors as follows. You do your object name, dot style, dot cursor equals cursor types. Where object is a page object, it will display the cursor style when hovered over by the mouse pointer. It says create a customized uh, cursor from an image file using URL, uh, then in parentheses image, where image is an image file. Example, cur URL, and then jpf underscore pencil dot uh, png. You see By default, the uh, click point for a cursor is located at the top left corner of the cursor image at the coordinate 0, 0. Why is the top left corner 0, 0? How big is my monitor? Don't know, right? If I were to view the display options, um, I could tell you the width and the height. Is every if is every uh, screen different? Yeah. So every screen is different. So um, it's not easy to uh, be able to program. So they oftentimes will put zero zero in the upper left hand corner here, and then as it's going to the right, it's increasing, and as it's going down, it's increasing. Does that make sense on the coordinate system? In algebra, if this was 0, 0 or origin, what would this? This would be my y values, right? Would it be positive or negative going down? Be negative, right? This is what threw me on um, when I first ran across Unity. Because where's 0, 0 at on Unity? Exactly in the middle. And uh, I've never seen a package like that. Everything else has always been the upper left hand corner is zero, zero. Um, X is the X coordinate, Y is the Y coordinate, the click, click point in, in pixels. So you can choose a different location. Working with functions as objects. That's curious. I didn't do the little trick of shutting off the webcam before I started recording. I'd like to know the pattern why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Everything in JavaScript is an object, including functions. Anything that can be done with an object can be done with a function. Including storing a function as a variable, storing a function as an object property. Now these are just strange, uh, where you treat a function as an object. Seeing this in different programming languages and just uh, understand the, the principle is just just different. Uh, use using one function as a parameter and another function. Um, 
nesting one function with a, within another function. Returning a function is all the result of another function and modifying the properties of function. If you had this algebra, f of x equals 2x plus 3, and g of x is equal to 7x minus 1. Are they functions? They are, aren't they? Um, what does this x mean? We can pass a number into it? Like you could have f of... Um, f of 2, what would you do if you pass 2 in for x? Yeah. So in terms of a like a function we were programming in JavaScript, you know, if I named a function f, and I'm passing in an x value. And maybe this is where I'm returning 2 times x plus 3. Well, that's pretty obvious. You can uh, then call it Okay, I'm curious. Function f of x. Then return 2 times x plus 3. And then down here, I'm going to do an alert, and I'm, I'm going to calculate f of 2. Don't know if this will work. What is it? No, it's not defined. Some numbers button. Some numbers button. Line 38. Oh, right there. Seven. Okay. Like I say, I've never tried to program an algebraic function into a calculator, but it's the same principle, isn't it? I had somebody in a programming class in a discussion post say they made that uh, comment. They said uh, function is no different than a function in algebra. It performs the same same uh, task. You're passing in a value for x, and then you're doing the calculation, and then you're returning the value. Now, return returns the value, the answer of this, to where it was called from. And that's why I did an alert f of 2 down here. Okay, now that we've defined uh, what a function is there, from algebra... By the way, what we just did is we found f of 2. Can you do that in algebra? You may not have saw it in algebra 2. 
This is called composition of functions, where you pass a function into a function. And what you do is you would uh, take your 2x uh, plus 3. Well, first off, I could replace g of x with 7x minus 1. So we're finding f of 7x minus 1. And then um, I'm going to take that 7x minus 1 and plug it in everywhere I have an x in f of x. Like this. And that gives us 14x minus 2 plus 3. Or 14x plus 1. Using one function as a parameter and another function. Like I said, it's just kind of strange when you're passing a function in as a parameter. Um, and that's not quite how I think they're meaning to do it. Um, but uh, there's more to it than what I'm showing. And then nesting, returning, and modifying. Here's a uh, function hello. And then I'm doing alert, welcome to Angie, Angie. Uh, function operator, the definition of the function becomes the variable's value. You see you got var hello equals function. And then we're um, passing in this right here. Hmm. Bar hello equals function. Alert, welcome. So down here, hello. See if that works. Like I say, I've never, I've never used this one either. Seven. Welcome. That's what we uh, printed, wasn't it? Now instead of that, let me um. Let me pass in a, ver a variable, string x. Let me change it like this, see if it takes it. So down here then, I'm going to pass in hello, welcome. Uh, I think I'm lying to you. I think I want this to be string X. And down here, I want to say alert. Like that. Don't know about semicolons. I expect it in the input. Oh. I don't think I'm be able to get that to work. Let 
me come back up to here. And I'll say hello. Well, I can't do it on the return. Hello. Uh, alert. Hi. Or welcome. Seven, didn't like the welcome. Must not have some kind of code right there. But I got their example here working. Doesn't really show the true power of it. Um, because this looks like it's hard coded. It doesn't have to be hard coded. You can be passing in whatever kind of lines of code you want. Okay, the other two ways of defining the hello function, the different how they're stored. Functions defined with a function declaration are created and stored, saved as a browser parses the code prior to the script being run. Since the function is already stored in memory, the statements that run the function can be placed prior to the statement that declares the function. Function operators evaluate as they appear in the script after the code has been parsed by the browser. Uh, function operators are more flexible than function declarations. The line of function can be placed anywhere a variable can be placed. Um, just takes a lot more thought process of how in the world could this actually make sense. Anonymous functions. Anonymous function has a function declaration without the function name. And I've never used this. The following structure is an anonymous function. You got a function and then a beginning parentheses, closing parentheses. So there's no name. And then your commands. Anonymous function can be inserted into any expression where a function reference is required. Functions that are named uh, are called name functions. Uh, anonymous functions are more concise and easier to manage because the function is directly included with the expression that invokes it. And anonymous functions limit the scope of the function to exactly where it's needed. Hmm. I don't know why you would want to do it, but here's an example of it. You got your function, then your beginning parentheses, closing parentheses, your curly brackets, your lines of code, and it's where the function name would be. Now you have this option versus declaring a function up here and putting all these lines of code up there. I don't know why you actually use anonymous here, what the benefits truly are with it. Passing variable values in anonymous functions, JavaScript supports two types of variables, global variables declared outside of any function and thus are accessible throughout the app. Uh, local variables declared within a function and only accessible code within that function. Just generally, var a is equal to 10. So we have that up there. And Get rid of some of these. I'm going to do an alert A. And down here I'll call add it. Get rid of that E. Let's see if that works.
Uh, unexpected token, extra parentheses. Came back with 10, which is value we set it for, right? Now let's say I declare a var, a var A in here. Not 10. Say I declare it as 5. So it says 5, doesn't it? So the local variable which declared right here. They're both declared A, aren't they? The local variable overrode the global variable. So when I went to access the value of A, it did not go back up to my global variable up here. Now, if I come down here and after the edit, I uh, say alert and I'll print A. What do you think this is going to print, by the way? Value the global or local? Global, if it works. I don't guarantee I don't use global variables in JavaScript. Okay, come down there, click 5, 10. So the 5 came from my called add it. Within add it, I declared A, and then I printed it. And A is declared globally up here, which um, is what this one accesses. So yeah, it accesses the global variable. Um, got laptops here. Um, two of you using the laptops here in Wellington. Are you allowed to take laptops home? No. So they're local to this building, right? This this room specifically. Can't take them out of this room. That's a principle of this variable right here. A local variable is only accessible from within this function. You can't use it outside of it. Um, now, how about your um, pins? Assuming you have pins, what would that be? Local or global? Global. global. Yeah, you, you actually brought it in from home, didn't you? I didn't give you any pins. And you can take them out of here. Can you use them while you're in here? You can. Um, that's where you have to get really careful because if you got these named the same things, Knowing which A is A is a challenge. Now, this is a concept of local and global variables you'll see in every programming language. Some people like to put everything into a global variable, like this right here. Just because, they, well, then I can access wherever it's at. Problem with that is, is this consumes memory all the time. So if I have a whole bunch of memory variables here, um, then it's keeping all that in memory. This declares the variable to use, allocates a memory, it uses it, and when it's done, when it's done running this function, it returns the memory to, the pro to your program. So it says, okay, I'm done with uh, this variable called A. You can have your memory back. You wouldn't think it would matter much, but it actually does uh, for your memory management. Um, <laughs> it slows things down if you don't return your memory. Some of you have heard uh, the, the C++ language we looked at earlier. Does anybody know anything about C++? The, um, one of the concepts that they had for C++ is that it handled memory management better. Um, because all, all packages have the same principle if you're designing system software, is to how do you return that memory? You know, if you're writing a real low level. And... Um, C didn't necessarily do a great job at that. But C++ supposedly handled the memory cleanup better. 
Everybody good on the difference between global and local? Well, this is just saying that these uh, global and local variables apply um, in this type of function. Global variables should be avoided when possible because global variables are accessible to every function in the application. That may be uh, good or bad. Task of tracking which functions are using and modifying the global variables becomes increasingly difficult as the application grows in size and complexity. Used to be bad programming. I, I like bad programming way back when. It's COBOL. And they had, um, you'd say, perform uh, function A varying X from 1 to 5. So you call that. And then you have function A here that would go like this. Let's say sum is equal to sum plus X. This is nowhere close to the, the syntax for COBOL. And you would call this function here varying x from 1, 1 to 5. So 1, x would be 1 to begin with, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5. Versus, you have function A here. And... Um, you initialize x, like you said, equal to 1. And then um, you have it equal 0. Then you increase. Actually, maybe you wouldn't even set equal to 0. So x is equal to x plus 1. And um, if x is less than 5, then go to next pass. And actually, I guess I could say x is equal to 0. And then you'd have this, ver this label called next pass. This isn't JavaScript. This was a, a pseudocode that's uh, how COBOL used to work. Which one do you think is better, programming-wise? Of course, if I actually did it right, sum is equal to sum plus x. This is the one that technically you were supposed to use. Uh, it was frowned upon to ever use a go-to. I think I cringed earlier in the course because they used a label in one of the program languages. I don't remember which one. I think it was JavaScript, actually. Um, you never use go-tos. This was uh, preferable. Problem with this is when you're looking at the code, this was way up here. This uh, was uh, maybe there was a... Uh, 2,000 lines of code in here. And you come down here and you're trying to follow this code here. What are you, what are you not remembering? What X is looping from? From 1 to 5? This code here, though, can you, uh, do you need to look uh, 2,000 lines up? No. So you know exactly what it's doing here. And so when you're scanning code and trying to figure out how to change it, then everything's self-contained within one function. I liked it. Uh, other people didn't. Uh, Go-tos just are generally frowned upon. That's what they're talking about here. Task of tracking which functions are using and modifying a global variable becomes increasingly difficult as the application grows in size and complexity. When you're looking at uh, this right here, Everything here is self-contained in this one function, isn't it? 
Now, how about if I put part of the variables down here? Like I put um, var a is equal to 5, and then I'm going to pass in, or maybe I have um, index equals 0, like this. And up here, I declare variables index and the sum, or the sum. And I get rid of these two lines of code right here. Gives me 10, 5, it still ran, didn't it? Did I get an error? No. But when I'm looking at this code right here, what is index equal to? To begin with? Wrong. It's a good try, though. How would I find out what index is equal to? I'd have to scroll down here and see what I said it equal to, right? Do you see how when it's not self-contained within that one function, it's hard to hard to debug? It was like what he was saying. He was looking at it, it's like, well, what in the world does it mean? That's what happens when you start using global variables too much. You kind of you lose track of everything. It seems really handy at time. Put everything at top. You never have to declare them everywhere. You can use them at every function, um, but then you it just um, becomes difficult as application grows, just like it says. The advantage of using an anonymous function is that they reduce the need for global variables because they perform their actions locally within a function. One of the challenges of anonymous functions is keeping track of all the nested levels of functions and procedures. Um, oftentimes when you embed code within uh, another another event of some sort, it just becomes a challenge to keep track of everything. How many lines of code can I put down here, do you think? Infinite? I could put an infinite number, couldn't I? You know, to keep track of it, maybe I'd put these all on separate lines down here. So maybe I'd do something like that. Uh, passing variable values in anonymous functions. You see, we've got our function here, and then we've got a. Um, They're not putting any lines of code in here. It says remove the hints after 0 0.5 seconds. But what did they forget to put? They didn't put any code here, did they? Uh, now, maybe just by running a function, it gets rid of hints automatically. I don't know. Interesting. Either that or they just forgot to put the code. Uh, displaying dialog boxes, alert uh, dialog box can be created using the following alert method. We've seen this over and over. Um, there's a prompt here. Displays a prompt box for the prompt user to enter uh, input text. So down, um, boy, I really got this messed up. Change that back to add it.
instead of a pro this. Prompt. And um, got our text. What is your name? Comma. And then um, I believe where we're going to. Oh, default input. Okay. And so um, I'll just say name. Typically, the prompt actually assigned to a variable, and I'm guessing that's what we'll have to do here, but we'll see. Props up, says, what is your name? And then I type in David, press OK. But if I say string equals, then if I say alert, welcome, string, Like that, I'll put in David, click OK, and it says, Welcome, David. This is what I was talking about. It wasn't really in their, their uh, examples there, but you really need to assign it to a variable so you can do something with it. Um, let's see. Looks like this is the confirm. This displays a kind of confirmation box, return a value if true. Uh, if they click the OK, false. If they click the cancel. So this is where you can do an if statement. So if I say if confirm, do you want me to delete the hard drive? I cannot type today. Alert. Hard drive wiped out. Else alert uh, will not delete the hard drive. Okay, so come up here, refresh that, click the add button. Put in David. It says welcome David. Didn't like something about uh unless I just didn't save it. I didn't save it. Let's try it again. I'll file save. Okay, David, welcome. Do you want me to delete the hard drive? I click OK. It says hard drive wiped out. So the confirm will actually ask you, uh, and you click OK and cancel and return true or false. When I embed it inside an if statement, if you click the OK, it returns true. And so this is true, and then it'll do this code. If you click the cancel, it'll come down here and do the else. Um, there's the puzzle box one they're building upon. And that's the end of that uh, tutorial.
Now I want you to um, write a um, JavaScript code. You have the remaining time to do it. Um, where you bring in um, two names, first name and last name. And I want you to uh, basically uh, concatenate them together and say, welcome David Hayes to my program. Does that make sense what I'm looking for? Um, uh, use a um, alert is how you'd write it out. And you should get it with a prompt. So it's just kind of a variation of this, uh, this one we got right here.